Chapter 16 Through the Trap Door In years to come, Harry would never quite remember how he had managed to get through his exams when he half expected Voldemort to come bursting through the door at any moment. Yet the days crept by, and there could be no doubt that Fluffy was still alive and well behind the locked door. It was sweltering hot, especially in the large classroom where they did their written papers. They had been given special new quills for the for the exams, which had been bewitched with an anti-cheating spell. They had practical exams as well. Profle Professor Flitwick called them one by one into his classroom to see if they could make a pineapple tap dance across their desk. Professor McGonagall watched them turn in turn a mouse into a snuff box. Points were given for how pretty the snuff box was, but taken away if it had whiskers. Snape made them all nervous, breathing down their necks when, while they tried to rem remember how to make a thoughtfulness potion. Forgetfulness potion. Harry did the best he could, trying to ignore the stabbing pains in his forehead, which he had been, which had been bothering him ever since his trip into the forest. Neville thought Harry had a bad case of exam nerves because Harry couldn't sleep, but the truth was that Harry kept wishing, kept being woken up by his old nightmare. Except that it was now worse than ever because there was a hooded figure dripping blood in it. Maybe it was because they hadn't seen what Harry had seen in the forest, or because they didn't have scars burning on their foreheads, but Ron and Hermione didn't seem as worried about the stone as Harry. The idea of Voldemort certainly scared them, but he didn't keep visiting them in dreams, and they were so busy with their studying that they didn't have much time to fret about what Snape or anyone else might be up to. Their very last exam was History of Magic, one hour of answering questions about batty old wizards who'd invented self-stirring cauldrons and they'd be free, free for a whole wonderful week until their exams results came out. When the ghost of Professor Binns told them to put down their quills and roll up their parchment, Harry couldn't help cheering with the rest. This was far easier than I thought it would be, said Hermione, as they joined the crowds flocking out onto the sunny grounds. I needn't have learned about the 1637 werewolf code of conduct or the uprising of Elfric the Eager. Hermione always liked to go through their exam paper afterwards, but Ron had said that this made him feel ill, so they were wandering down to the lake and flopped under a tree. The Weasley twins and Lee Jordan were tickling the tentacles of a giant squid, which was basking in the warm shallows. No more studying, Ron sighed happily, stretching out on the grass. You could look more cheerful, Harry. We've got a week before we have to find out how badly we've done. There's no need to worry yet. Harry was rubbing his forehead. I wish I knew what this means, he burst out angrily. My scar keeps hurting. It's happened before, but never as often as this. Go to Madame Pomfrey, Hermione suggested. I'm not ill, said Harry. I think it's a warning. It means danger's coming. Ron couldn't get worked up. It was too hot. Harry, relax. Hermione's right. And stone's safe as long as... Dumbledore's around. Anyway, we've never had any proof Snape found out how to get past Fluffy. He nearly had his leg ripped off once. He's not going to try it again in a hurry. And Neville will play Quidditch for England before Hagrid lets Dumbledore down. Harry nodded, but he couldn't shake off a lurking feeling that there was something he'd forgotten to do. Something important. When he tried to explain this, Hermione said, That's just the exams. I woke up last night and was halfway through my transfiguration notes before I remembered we've done that one. Harry was quite sure the unsettled feeling didn't have anything to do with work, though. He watched an owl flutter towards the school across the bright blue sky, a note clamped in its mouth. Hagrid was only the only one who ever sent him letters. Hagrid would never betray Dumbledore. Hagrid would never tell anyone how to get past Fluffy. Never. But... Harry suddenly jumped to his feet. Where are you going? said Ron sleepily. I've just thought of something, said Harry. 
He had turned white. We've got to go and see Hagrid, now. Why? panted Hermione, hurrying to keep up. Don't you think it's a bit odd? said Harry, scrambled up, scrambling up the grassy slope. That what Hagrid wants more than anything else is a dragon, and a stranger turns up who just happens to have an egg in his pocket. How many people wander around with dragon eggs if it's against wizard law? Lucky they found Hagrid, don't you think? Why didn't I see it before? What are you talking about? said Ron, but Harry sprinting across the ground towards the forest didn't answer. Hagrid was sitting in an armchair outside his house. His trousers and sleeves were rolled up and he was shelling peas into a large bowl. Hello, he said, smiling. Finished your exams? Got time for a drink? Yes, please, said Ron, but Harry cut him off. No, we're in a hurry. Hagrid, I've got to ask you something. You know, that night you won Norbert. What did the stranger you were playing cards with look like? Dunno, said Hagrid casually. He wouldn't take his cloak off. He saw the three of them look stunned and raised his eyebrows. It's not that unusual. You get a lot of funny old folk in the hog's head. That's the pub down in the village. Might have been a dragon dealer, mightn't he? I never saw his face. He kept his hood up. Harry sank down next to the bowl of peas. What did you talk to him about, Hagrid? Did you mention Hogwarts at all? Might have come up, said Hagrid, frowning as he tried to remember. Yeah, he asked what I did and I told him I was a gamekeeper here. He asked a bit about the sort of creatures I took after. So I told him and I said what I'd always really wanted was a dragon and then I can't remember too well because he kept buying me drinks let's see yeah then he said I had the dragon egg and we could play cards for it if I wanted but he had to be sure I couldn't handle it I could handle it he didn't want it to go to any old home so I told him after fluffy a dragon would be easy. And did he, did he seem interested in Fluffy? Harry asked, trying to keep his voice calm. Well, yeah, how many three-headed dogs do you meet, even around Hogwarts? So I told him, Fluffy's a piece of old cake. If you know how to calm him down right, just play him a bit of old music and he'll go straight off to sleep. Hagrid suddenly looked horrified. I shouldn't have told you that, he blurted out. Forget I said that. Hey, where are you going? Harry, Ron and Hermione didn't speak to each other at all until they came to the halt in came to a halt in the entrance hall, which seemed very cold and gloomy after the grounds. We've got to go to Dumbledore, said Harry. Hagrid told that stranger how to get past Fluffy and it was either Snape or Voldemort under that cloak. It must have been easy. Once he got Hagrid drunk, I just hope Dumbledore believes us. Firenze might back us up if Bane doesn't stop him. Where's Dumbledore's office? They looked around as if hoping to see a sign pointing them in the right direction. They had been told where d they ha had never been told where Dumbledore lived, nor did they know anyone who had been sent to see him. We'll just have to Harry began, but suddenly rang across the hall. What are you three doing inside? What are you three doing inside? It was Professor McGonagall, carrying a large pile of books. We want to see Professor Dumbledore, said Hermione, rather bravely. Harry and Ron thought, See Professor Dumbledore? Professor McGonagall repeated, as though this was a very fishy thing to want to do. Why? Harry swallowed. Now what? It's sort of a secret, he said, but he wished at once he hadn't because Professor McGonagall's nostrils flared. Professor Dumbledore left ten minutes ago, she said coldly. He received an, he, he received an urgent hour from the Ministry of Magic and flew off for London at once. He's gone, said Harry frantically. Now, Professor Dumbledore is a very great wizard, Potter. 
He has very many demands on his time. But this is important. Something you have to say if more important something you have to say is more important than the Ministry of Magic, Potter. Look, said Harry, throwing caution to the winds. Professor, it's about the sorcerer's stone. Whatever Professor McGonagall had expected, it wasn't that. The book she was carrying tumbled out of her arms, but she didn't pick them up. How do you know? She spluttered. Professor, I think I know that... Well, someone's going to try and steal the stone. I've got to talk to Professor Dumbledore. She eyed him with a mixture of shock and suspicion. Professor Dumbledore will be back tomorrow, she said finally. I don't know how I don't know how you found out about the stone, but rest assured, no one can possibly steal it. It's too well protected. But Professor Potter, I know what I'm talking about, she said shortly. She bent down and gathered up the fallen books. I suggest you all go back outside and enjoy the sunshine. But they didn't. It's tonight, said Harry, once he was sure Professor McGonagall was out of earshot. Snape's going through the trap door tonight. He found out everything he needs and now he's got Dumbledore out of the way. He sent that note. I bet the Ministry of Magic will get a real shock when Dumbledore turns up. But what can we? Hermione grasped. Harry and Ron wheeled around. Snape was standing there. Good afternoon, he said smoothly. They stared at him. You shouldn't be inside on a day like this, he said with an odd twisted smile. We were, Harry began, without any idea what he was going to say. You want to be more careful, said Snape. Hanging around like this. People will think you're up to something. And Gryffindor really can't to afford to lose any more points, can it? Harry flushed. They turned to go outside, but Snape called them back. Be warned, Potter. Any more nighttime wanderings and I will personally make sure you are expelled. Good day to you. He strode off in the direction of the staff room. Out on the stone steps, Harry turned to the others. Right, here's what we've got to do, he whispered urgently. One of us have, has got to keep an eye on Snape. Wait outside the staff room and follow him if he leaves it. Hermione, you'd better do that. Why me? It's obvious, said Ron. You can pretend to be waiting for Professor Flitwick, you know. He put on a high voice. Oh, Professor Flitwick, I'm so worried. I think I got question 14b wrong. Oh, shut up, said Hermione, but she agreed to go and watch out for Snape. And we'd better stay outside the third floor corridor, Harry told Ron. Come on. But that part of the plan didn't work. No sooner had they reached the door separating Fluffy from the rest of the school than Professor McGonagall turned up again and this time she lost her temper. I suppose you think you'd, you're would you harder to get past than a pack of enchantments, she stormed. Enough of this nonsense. If I hear you've come anywhere near here again, I'll take another 50 points from Gryffindor. Yes, Weasley from my own house. Harry and Ron went, Harry and Ron went back to the common room. Harry had just said, at least Hermione's on Snape's tail, when the portrait of the flat Lady swung open and Hermione came in. I'm sorry, Harry, she wailed. Snape came out and asked me what I was doing, so I said I was waiting for Flit Flitwick, and Snape went to get him. And I've only just got away. I don't know where Snape went. Well, that's it then, isn't it? Harry said. The other two stared at him. He was pale and his eyes were glittering. I'm going out of here tonight and I'm going to try and get the stone first. You're mad, said Ron. You can't, said Hermione. After what McGonagall and Snape have said, you'll be expelled. So what, Harry shouted. Don't you understand? If Snape gets hold of the stone, Voldemort's coming back. Haven't you heard what it was like when he was trying to take over? There won't be any Hogwarts to get expelled from. 
He'll flatten it or turn it into a school for the dark arts. Losing points doesn't matter anymore. Can't you see? Do you think he'll leave you and your families alone if Gryffindor wins, wins the House Cup? If I get caught before I get to the stone, well, I'll have to go back to the Dursleys and wait for Voldemort to find me there. It's only dying a bit later than I would have. Because I'm never going over to the dark side. I'm going through the trapdoor tonight and nothing you two say is going to stop me. Voldemort killed my parents, remember? He glared at them. You're right, Harry, said Hermione in a small voice. I'll use the invisibility cloak, said Harry. It's just lucky I got it back. But will it cover all three of us, said Ron. All, all three of us? Oh, come off it. You don't think we're going to let you go alone? Of course not, said Hermione briskly. How do you think you get the stone without us? I'd better go and look through my books. There might be something useful. But if we get caught, you two will be expelled too. Not if I can help it, said Hermione grimly. Flitwick told me in secret that I got 112% on his exam. They're not throwing me out after that. After dinner, the three of them sat nervously apart in the common room. Nobody bothered them. None of the Gryffindors had anything to say to Harry anymore. After all, this was the first night he hadn't been upset by it. Hermione was skimming through all her notes, hoping to come across one of the enchantments that they were about to try and break. Harry and Ron didn't talk much. Both of them were thinking about what they were going to what they were about to do. Slowly the room emptied as people drifted off to bed. Better get the cloak, Ron muttered as Lee Jordan finally left. Stretching and yawning, Harry ran upstairs to their dark dormitory. He pulled out the cloak and then his eyes fell on the flute Hagrid had given him for Christmas. He pocketed it, pocketed it to use on Fluffy. He didn't feel much like singing. He ran back down the common room. We'd better put the cloak on here and make it sure it all covers three of, it covers all three of us. If Filch spots one of our feet wandering along on its own. What are you doing? said a voice from the corner of the room. Neville appeared from behind an armchair, clutching Trevor the Toad, who looked as though he'd been able he'd been making another bid for freedom. Nothing, Neville, nothing, said Harry, hurriedly putting the cloak back behind his back. Neville stared at the guilty faces. You're going out again, he said. No, 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 said H Hermione. No, we're not. Why don't you go to bed, Neville? Harry looked at the grandfather clock by the door. They couldn't afford to waste any more time. Snape might even now be playing Fluffy to sleep. You can't go out, said Neville. You'll be caught again. Gryffindor will be in even more trouble. You don't understand, said Harry. This is important. But Neville was clearly steeling himself to do something desperate. I won't let you do it, he said, hurrying to stand in front of the portrait hole. I'll, I'll fight you. Neville, Ron exploded. Get away from that hole and don't be an idiot. Don't you call me an idiot, said Neville. I don't think you should be breaking any more rules. And you were the one who told me to stand up to people. Yes, but not us, said Ron in exasperation. Neville, you don't know what you're doing. He took a step forward and Neville dropped Trevor the Toad, who leapt out of sight. Go on then, try and hit me, said Neville, raising his fists. I'm ready. Harry turned to Hermione. Do something, he said desperately. Hermione stepped forward. Neville, she said, I'm really, really sorry about this. She raised her wand. Petrificus totalis, she cried, pointing it at Neville. Neville's arms snapped to his sides. His legs sprang together, his whole body rigid. He swayed where he stood and then fell flat on his face, stiff as a board. Hermione ran to turn him over. Neville's jaws were, ja Neville's jaws were jammed together so he couldn't speak. Only his eyes were moving, looking at them in horror. What have you done to him? Harry whispered. It's the full body bind, she said Hermione miserably. Oh, Neville, 
I'm so sorry. We had to, Neville. No time to explain, said Harry. You'll understand later, Neville, said Ron, as they stepped over him and pulled on the invisibility cloak. But leaving Neville lying motionless on the floor didn't feel like a very good omen. In their nervous state, every statue's shadows looked like filch. Every distant breath of wind sounded like peeves swooping down on them. At the foot of their first set of stairs, they spotted Mrs Norris skulking near the top. Oh, let's kick her, just this once, Ron whispered in Harry's ear. But Harry shook his head, and they climbed carefully around her. Mrs Norris turned her lamp-like eyes on them, but didn't do anything. They didn't meet anyone else until they reached the staircase up to the third floor. Peeves was bobbing halfway up, loosening the carpet so people would trip.